It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of His Majesty's loyal opposition. Thank you, Speaker, and good morning. Uh, this question is for the Premier. Yesterday, we gave the government an opportunity to put children, to put kids first, an opportunity that this government passed on. We asked the government a simple question on behalf of our children. Will you fix our schools? The failure of this government to take inflation into its budget calculation is resulting in more crowded classrooms, more growing incidents of violence, and more school programs that are disappearing day by day by day. So I want to ask the Premier again, will the Premier explain to the children of this province why he doesn't like funding their schools? To respond, the Minister of Education. Mr. Speaker, when we came to office in 2017-18, the funding in Ontario was at $23 billion. Today it stands at north of $28 billion, a 22 per cent increase in funding, a proof positive of our government and Premier's commitment to invest in publicly funded schools. We are also the government that delivered stability for children, which your party and the Liberals could not have achieved. Four years of peace. With Catholic and public and English and French, two million kids have stability in the classrooms, and I, Order. I believe that is worthy of praise, that all the parties came together for the benefit of children in Ontario. Mr. Speaker, when it comes to mental health, when it comes to preventing violence and injury of our staff and of our kids, we are the government working with the Minister of Mental Health and Addiction to have increased funding in mental health by 577%. It is the most significant investment, and we mandated learning on mental health, the first in the, in the country to do so. We're going to keep investing to support our kids. Supplementary question. Speaker, a budget that ignores inflation is a budget that ignores reality. We have already, we have already lost 5,000 qualified educators since this government came into office. And with this budget, we're going to lose thousands and thousands more qualified, caring adults in our schools. The government thought that if they gave the funding formula a different name, that they rebranded it, families weren't going to notice that their kids are being shortchanged again. Well, I got news for you. They're noticing. Why is this government so determined to leave our education system worse than when they found it? Members, please take their seats. Minister of Education. You know, Mr. Speaker, last Friday I joined the member from Kitchener South Hespler in Hamilton at Interval House, where we announced a historic $875,000 investment to train high school coaches and teachers and students about the issue of violence against women, building healthy relationships in our schools, specifically tackling the issue of, secure, of safety when it comes to kids and our staff. That was an investment we made together because we believe there's more to do as we bring forth our policy on restricting cell phones, removing social Order. media, and banning vaping from Ontario schools. 200 high schools will receive this education. 400 coaches will benefit from this inter investment. And it wouldn't have been achieved if the member from Kitchener South Hesper didn't initiate this action and get it to the finish line for the benefit of families. That is how we make a difference in Ontario schools, by investing in prevention and upstream investments and through curriculum. We're working across the ministry, from health to education, social services, to make a difference and keep our kids safe. Final supplementary. Well, Speaker, uh, 14 cents per day per student on student safety, 22 cents per student per day on mental health. That, to me, is a shameful lack of uh, investment in our children's well-being. When the government cuts education funding, Speaker, it is parents who have to make up the difference. Parents who are right now struggling already with the cost of living are increasingly having to pay out of pocket for education supports for activities, and yes, even for mental health supports. This government is cutting education funding for our schools to the tune of $1,500 per student. That's a fact. And I want to know what the Premier thinks our children should do without. Is it breakfast programs? Is it counsellors? Is it music and sports, the things that bring joy Question. in your life? What is it that this government expects our schools to cut and our children to do without. 
Members, please take their seats. Minister of Education. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we increase staffing in Ontario schools by 9,000 additional education workers in the province of Ontario. <laughs> An inconvenient truth for the member opposite. 3,000 additional frontline educators. They don't just happen by chance. They happen because of investment, not in spite of it. And, member, and Mr. Speaker, I found that very curious. You know, the member's motion yesterday includes a component about supporting parents financially. But the member, the leader of the opposition, led the charge against our support for parent payments when we gave $200 and $400. You're laughing. $1.8 billion of investment Order. as you trivialize giving funding directly to parents. This is what's sort of ironic about your motion. On one hand, you call for us to back parents, but if only parents knew that you voted against five Response. iterations of payments to parents. It is regretful, it is shameful, and it's consistent with your support for higher taxation in this province. Remind the members to make their comments through the chair. The next question, once again, the Leader of the Opposition. i got to say, I was so disappointed yesterday in the government's responses uh, to the questions that Ontarians are asking. I didn't get the answers that we were looking for. I'm going to ask again and see if we get somewhere today. The Minister of Health said that recruitment and retention of family doctors was not a major concern. I want to say that again. Not a major concern. Wow. A quarter of patients in the Sioux without a family doctor. That's not a major concern for this minister. 30,000 patients in Kingston without access to primary care. Not a major concern. These comments are insensitive, considering there are 2.3, 2.4 million people in this province without a family physician, but they are also dangerous. So I want to ask this government again to the Premier, does he really think it's not a concern that millions of people are going without primary care? Parliamentary Assistant, Member for Stormont, Dundas, South Glengarry. Thank you, Speaker. Facts matter. The records matter, Speaker. In the NDP government, when they were in power for those short five years, and hopefully never again, and Order. the leader of the opposition was a staffer Order. at this time, they cut medical school enrollment by 10 per cent, Speaker. Order. In 2015, the Liberal Premier cut 50 resident spots, which amounts to hundreds less doctors serving in our province today, Speaker. Okay. Speaker, we expanded the Learn and Stay grant, which again, the opposition voted against, which provides tuition, books, supplies for nurses and other health care workers who work in underserved areas in our province. Speaker, we're also funding the largest expansion of the medical Order. school spots in over 15 years, Speaker, adding 1,212 undergraduates and 1,637 postgraduate seats across Ontario, <laughs> Speaker. 60% of these seats, Speaker, will be dedicated to family medicine, Speaker. What I do recommend is the Leader of the Opposition gets her party to support our budget, Speaker. Order. Order. Supplementary question. Speaker, I'm going to ask the, uh, the member there, the, the parliamentary assistant to the Minister of Health, to really think about this. People being diagnosed with cancer not in the comfort and the safety of their family doctor's office, but in an overcrowded emergency room. How do they get there? Because they don't have a family doctor. So by the time they get there, just imagine for a moment to the member opposite, being the emergency room physician who then has to tell that patient that not only do they have cancer, but that it's metastasized because they couldn't go to see their family doctor. They couldn't get screening. This is not a major concern. So I want to ask the member opposite. They're having you answer all the questions today. Is this not a major concern for you? And I remind the members to make their comments through the chair. Parliamentary Assistant, Minister of Health. What is a concern for me is the short-sighted policies of both the NDP and Liberals that cut those seats, Speaker. Right, that is why it. we are currently where we are today, Speaker. Since 2018, Speaker, we've registered over 80,000 new nurses in Ontario, as well as 12,500 new physicians, with 10 per cent of those being family physicians, Speaker. Last year alone, we registered 2,400 new doctors to practice in Ontario, Speaker. That was a record-breaking year for nurses in Ontario, Speaker. 
But we're not stopping there, Speaker. We will continue to ensure that the people of Ontario have what they need for health care. Speaker, we have 17,500 new nurses registered last year, which was a historic number, over 33,000 over the last two years, Speaker. We'll continue. We're investing significantly into our health human resources. In this year's budget, we have over $740 million to address immediate staffing needs, Speaker, uh, supporting the expansion of over 3,000 new nursing seats across Ontario. Speaker, Response. we'll continue doing what needs to be done to ensure that we have the best publicly funded health care system. Okay. The final supplementary. Speaker, historic wait times. Historic emergency room closures. Historic numbers of Ontarians without family doctors. Order. Own it. Order. Take some responsibility. You've been in government for six long years. You are responsible for the state of our health care system today. It is unimaginable, Speaker, that this minister doesn't see this as a concern, that this premier and this member don't see this as a concern. We are losing doctors and nurses and health care workers faster than we can recruit them. I want the members opposite for just a moment to imagine being the mother of a newborn. You have so many questions. You have nowhere to go for answers. Imagine you're the parent of a sick child and you find out you live in the Sioux and you find out now you have no family doctor. Where are you going to go? Take some responsibility. Own up to it. Will this government uh, admit that they have a problem on their hands and that it is unimaginable that their minister, who is supposed to be responsible for this, refused to live up to her responsibility? Members, will please take their seats. Member for Stormont, Dundas, South Glengarry. Sure, let me correct the Leader of the Opposition. Sometimes facts hurt. We have some of the shortest wait times in Canada, with over 80 per cent of people of Ontario getting their surgery within the recommended time. Speaker, we understand that more needs Order. to be done, and that's why we've invested $110 million into interprofessional primary care teams. Speaker. And then this year's budget, we actually added another $546 Order. million. Speaker, over 600,000 Ontarians are going to receive the care they need. Speaker, we'll continue to ensure that the health care system in Ontario is the best publicly funded system across all of Canada. Speaker. The next question. The member for Hamilton Mountain. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Today is the 10th anniversary of Children and Youth in Care Day, a day promised to kids who shared their stories, lived experiences, and recommendations. This morning, QP Frontline child protection workers, many are here today, released their survey results of young people who are being warehoused instead of being afforded safe homes. The results are shocking. Children and youth as young as two years old in hotel rooms, Airbnbs, for-profit facilities, and on cots in children's aids offices. So will the Premier and his minister, today on Children and Youth in Care Day, will you commit to sustainable funding for safe homes for our most vulnerable children and youth? Minister. Children, Community and Social Services. Well, thank you very much, Speaker. Yep. Thanks to my colleague for the question, Mr. Speaker. First and foremost, I'd like to thank the women and men who are doing great work to make sure that the children and youth in our province are served and protected, Mr. Speaker. That's what's driving the redesign of the child welfare system in, in the province of Ontario, Mr. Speaker. It was this government that took action. It was this government that said more reports, more discussions is not going to cut it. We need action, which is why, Mr. Speaker, we have more inspectors now hired across the province, which which is why we have more unannounced inspections being conducted across the province. Mr. Speaker, I've said it many times in this House, and I'll say it again. When it comes to children and youth, there may be a portion of our population, but they're 100 per cent of our future, and we will never give up on them, Mr. Speaker. We will do whatever it takes to make sure that they're served and protected, back that up by investments. Mr. Speaker, thanks to the Premier, the leadership of the Premier and the Minister of Finance and the President of the Bonds. Treasury Board in this caucus, the Ministry of Children, Community and Social Services has received increased funding two years in a row, more than $1.6 billion. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. This minister needs a reality check. Mm -hmm. Things have never been as bad as they are today. Tonight, 
On the 10th annual Children and Youth in Care Day, dozens of young people in care will be going to sleep in motels, hotels, short-term rentals because there are not enough foster beds or treatment facilities. A young person with autism will be sleeping in an agency's office, as they have been for months. Workers will be scrambling to provide a healthy meal in rooms which are dangerous and leave kids vulnerable to exposure of bed bugs, human trafficking, drug use. This is the state of too many children who have been separated by their families. This is the state of a system that, for the first time in history, is running millions of dollars in deficits. Will the Premier and his minister commit today to honour their duty? to Ontario's most vulnerable children and properly fund our child welfare system. Mr. Children, Community and Social Services. Mr. Speaker, the member talks about reality check. Yeah, yeah. It's unbelievable hearing a member of the NDP who held balance of power, who could have done so much for children and youth in this province, that did nothing, Mr. Speaker. It was this government, through the Child Welfare Redesign, who said, we don't need any more report writing. We want to stand up for children and youth in care in this province now. We want to make sure every child, every youth that is in care is treated the same as every child, regardless of their circumstance, Mr. Speaker. That's what's driving our redesign. We will never give up on, on children and youth. When it comes to the redesign, Mr. Speaker, part of that is the Ready, Set, Go program, which provides support for children in care as low as 13, Mr. Speaker, providing them, the supporting them with the life skills they need Order. at 13, at 15, right up to their 23rd birthday Response. with financial support, Mr. Speaker, something the previous government didn't do and something certainly was not a priority for the NDP. Order. Order. Stop the clock. The member for Hamilton Mountain will come to order. The member for St. Catharines will come to order. The member for Hamilton West and Castor Dundas will come to order. The member for Niagara Falls will come to order. Start the clock. The next question. The member for Perth Wellington. Uh, merci, Monsieur le Président. My question for the Minister. Thank you. My question for the Deputy is the following. Video, but he's not fooling anyone. Ontarians are paying more for food, gas, and home heating. And at a time when we are facing a 40 year high inflation rate, the Prime Minister and the Federal Liberals decided to hike the carbon tax by an additional 23 per cent. You can hear the groans already from the Independent Liberal Speaker. It's clear that the Liberals in this place do not care about affordability and addressing that. Under their leader, the carbon tax queen, Bonnie Crombie, they are content with seeing the tax continue to rise, eventually triple by 2030, Speaker. Hey. Speaker, this is unfair to Ontarians that are paying for the expense of failed Liberal policies. The Liberal carbon tax must come to an end. Speaker, with the summer quickly approaching, can the minister please explain how the carbon tax continues to burden every Ontarian? Thank you, Speaker. Minister of Northern Development, Minister of Indigenous Affairs. The House will come to order. Merci, Monsieur le Président, et merci la Thank you, Mr. President and the Deputy of Perth Wellington. It is true that this morning we have a friend from Quebec who is here, and it's very pleasant to have people who share the same uh, ideas here. The deputy from Quebec is here in Ontario to share the same position regarding the carbon tax. It's a useless tax. It is not an environmental plan. It's a budgetary plan, and our neighbors have the same message as our government. It is clear. It is crap, the tax. The message is clear. We have to scrap the tax. Supplementary question. Thank you. And for the minister, 
price of everything, and it costs Ontarians who can afford it least. This is a regressive tax, Speaker, and it's utterly a failure. It's disgraceful that the carbon tax queen, Bonnie Crombie, and her Liberal caucus support this tax grab that punishes the hard-working people of this province when they are just trying to get by. While the members opposite have no regard for fiscal discipline, as the people in Ontario truly understand after 15 years under the previous Liberal government, our government will continue to put Ontarians first, protect their hard-earned paychecks and savings. Can the minister please share with our House today, Speaker, how our government remains steadfast in investing the priorities that restore, resonate with the people of Ontario, while the NDP and Liberals across the aisle continue to support the carbon tax? Minister of Northern Development, Minister of Indigenous Affairs. As it sounds, Mr. Speaker, yesterday I introduced a new actor to the very complicated uh, carbon tax royal love story. We talked about the king of the carbon tax, uh, Prime Minister Trudeau, and his failure to rein in his friends and folks in the Liberal family. And of course, Prince Carney, a very smart man in his own right, just ask him, read the tea leaves. He said this is not a very good tax for Canadians right now. That's interesting, Mr. Speaker. Not sure whether it's driven from his intellect or from polls, Mr. Speaker, but here's what's clear. This introduced increased costs on every conceivable thing that the people of Ontario and the people of Quebec, Mr. Speaker, buy. From fuel to food, Mr. Speaker, from appliances to planting their gardens this spring, there's only one thing that's going to pop up every single what time, Mr. Speaker, and that's the carbon tax. Uh, that's yeah. why we take the position to just Fonts. stop this tax. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. The next question, the member for Nickel Belt. Thank you. My question is for the Minister of Health. According to ministry data, Ontario is presently short 13,000 nurses. In a few short years, this number will rise to 33,000 nurses. The number one reason for this shortage it is the workload that nurses face on each and every shift. What is this government doing to improve? The workload of our nurses. Government Assistant to Minister of Health and Member for Stormont Dundas, South Glengarry. Thank you, Speaker. Since Minister Jones was sworn in as Minister of Health, the government has registered a record number of new nurses two years in a row, Speaker, registering a total number of 32,000 wow. nurses in Ontario. Wow. Speaker, we achieved this by directing the College of Nurses of Ontario and the College of Physicians of Ontario to break down barriers for internationally trained and educated healthcare workers, and expanding programs like the Learn and Stay Grant, which I will remind the House Speaker the opposition voted against. Oh. Our government has invested nearly a billion dollars into the home and community care sector. Speaker, this funding has not only added thousands of PSWs; in fact, we've added nearly 25,000 since 2021. <laughs> But it has also increased the compensation for the PSWs, nurses, and other frontline health care providers to further stabilize the workforce. Speaker, we know that more needs to be done, and that's why, part of our 2024 budget, our government Response. is investing another $743 million to continue to grow our health care workforce. Speaker, we will continue to do what needs to be done to ensure that we have the best publicly funded health care system. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. It gets worse. The ministry data tells us that Ontario is short 38,000 PSW. In three years, this number will be 50,000 PSW short. It doesn't matter how many PSW we train, 25% of them, a quarter of them, leave their profession each and every year. Why are dedicated PSWs leaving their profession? Their working condition. What? is this government doing to improve the working conditions of PSW? Minister of Colleges and Universities. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And you know what we are doing is training more PSWs, more new nurses. Initiatives like the Ontario Learn and Stay program. We have 3,500 graduates that are becoming through the program that are nurses, lab techs, paramedics in underserved regions of the province. These students uh, have the educational costs covered by the government in order to fill those spaces. In fact, there are actually six students for every um, 
nursing space in Ontario. This is a growing profession, and we have students across the province who are looking to become nurses. We are going to continue to work with our post-secondary partners to ensure that we have nurses, paramedics, lab techs, PSWs across Ontario. Thank you. The next question, the member for Flamborough, Glanville. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Labour, Immigration, Training and Skills Development. Mm. The Liberal carbon tax raises the price of absolutely everything in our province and is hurting our economy and our workers. It drives up the costs of everyday essentials like food, heating and transportation. Speaker, with a rapidly growing population, we need all hands on deck to start building right across Ontario. But the costly carbon tax is hurting our workers' ability to invest in their skills and development to build a better future for Ontario. The federal government needs to finally listen to what our government has been asking from day one and eliminate this job-killing tax. Mm. Speaker, can the minister outline the steps that our government is taking to fight the carbon tax and to ensure Ontario has the workforce that we need to start building for the future? The parliamentary assistant and member for Ajax. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member for that question. On this side of the House, we know that Ontario's prosperity hinges on our ability to address the present issue of our province in labour shortage, particularly in the skilled trades. Sadly, the carbon tax is only increased in these issues. Ontarians are deeply concerned about the cost of living crisis that the carbon tax has created. And while the Crombie Liberals would like to separate this issue, we, do the, we on this side of the House know that the cost of workers don't just end at the workplace. Whether it's being able to cover the cost of one's commute or the ability to invest in the tools and skills that you need, we know that it's just essential for workers' success. We see the Liberals at every turn working hard to make it harder for Ontarians to survive. In stark contrast to our government, has adopted a wholly different approach. We are committed to empowering our workforce by launching a comprehensive skilled trade strategy, Fonts. supporting nearly $1.5 billion in funding over the next four years. Together, we are unified in our effort to build the future for our province deserves. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and back to the parliamentary assistant. The Liberal carbon tax is hurting the household budgets for individuals and families right across Ontario. Ontarians should not be subjected to a tax that does nothing but burden them with unnecessary costs. To make matters worse, the Liberals in this legislature, under the leadership of a woman who loves the carbon tax, Bonnie Crombie, ignore the hard-working women and men of our province who oppose this punitive tax. But, Speaker, it's not surprising, considering for 15 years the previous Liberal government failed all Ontarians and drove 300,000 manufacturing jobs right out of Ontario. Now they want to make it harder for young people to get the skills and the tools they need to enter the skilled trades by supporting the federal Liberal carbon tax. That's unacceptable. Speaker, can the parliamentary sure. assistant tell the House what our government is doing to get more people into the skilled trades despite the Liberals advancing their anti worker carbon tax agenda? Member for Ajax. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member for that question. For years, Speaker, the li previous Liberal government has neglected the skilled trades. Their failure to prioritize these crucial sectors resulted in a significant decline in apprenticeship applications, leaving thousands of well-paying jobs unfilled and undermining our Ontario's economy. And if this wasn't bad enough, for a decade and half, for a decade and half of for a decade of and a half of complete neglect, the Liberal federal friends are discouraging more Ontarians from entering the trades. Yet our government is resolute in its commitment to rectifying this Liberal mess and ensuring that Ontario's economy works for everyone. We're accomplishing this by investing in our workforce. We have launched over $1.5 billion skilled trade development fund aimed at training Ontario's next generation of workers. And Mr. Speaker, we have seen the results. Bonds. To date, over half a million workers have benefited, and 597 training and workforce development projects have been, received funding. We continue to be steadfast in our determination to clean this mess. Thank you. 
Thank you. The next question, the member from Meshkigawak, James Bay. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister of Natural Resources. We know we are 200 firefighters short. Last week, the minister said our crews were so ready that we will be able to send them in other provinces. Minister, if this government is that ready to face wildfires, how many firefighters are we going to share with other provinces when we are short 200 firefighters today? Mr. Natural Resources and Forestry. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And I must say that you know one of the hallmarks of our firefighting service here in Ontario is that we do help out other jurisdictions at their time of need. So we know that forest fires right now in BC and Alberta and Manitoba are significant, and we hope and pray that the situations there go well. But we stand at the ready, Mr. Speaker, to help because that's what Ontario does. That's what firefighters all throughout all the jurisdictions in Canada do. They help one another when they have the resources to help. And here in Ontario, where we had a firefighting budget of $69 million when we took over. It was disrespected and neglected by the previous government, supported by the NDP. We upped that budget to $135 million a year wow. to build That's capacity, nice. to be able to help, to be able to be there for others in this country who need that assistance. So, Mr. Speaker, we're here for Ontarians every single day. We're here for Canadians every single day. Great Supplementary questions. Monsieur le Président, les conservateurs conservatives of Alberta did the same thing as Ontario since 2018 to cut continuously in prevention against forest fires. Today, we see the consequences of those choices in Alberta. Mr. Minister, will you repeat the same mistakes as your friends in Alberta and make us vulnerable and dependent on other provinces? Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Mr. Speaker, uh, I can't repeat enough uh, because I've said it time and time again, and the opposition just doesn't seem to get it, that we continue to make more investments in firefighting in Ontario than any previous government ever has. And again, 15 years of disrespect and neglect by the members opposite and the Liberal independents, and supported by the NDP, we had to clean up that mess. We're the ones that had to make the investments. And it's not only in the base budget that we made that investments. Last fall, $20 million additional to look at alternative ways to fight fires in Ontario. How can we bring new aerial technologies in? How can we work with universities on collaborative research agreements about the changing dynamics of wildfires? How can we continue to support our great wildfire rangers that are out there doing the work every day? The Ministry of Labour stepped up Response. with receptive coverage. We've stepped up with uh, more uh, 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 things for them to make sure that they can do the job the best they can every single day, including a recruitment and retention bonus, including supports for training. So we're there every day, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The next question, the member for Don Valley West. Thank you, Speaker. We learned recently that this government is once again hiding information from the people of Ontario. This time, it's about how many health care workers they will be short because of their damaging, unconstitutional Bill 124. But, Speaker, this behaviour is not a surprise from this government. They are experts at pulling down the blinds on the press's right to light and transparency. Whether it's ministerial mandate letters, the details of the shameful 95-year lease with a foreign-owned spa, the real reason they're closing the Ontario Science Centre and building a parking lot for their spa friends, the criminal investigation into the Greenbelt scandal, or how they've doubled the number of staff riding the gravy train in the Premier's office, this government has no qualms about hiding their flaws. My question to the Premier, why does he like hiding information from the people of Ontario? Hey. Government House Leader. Unbelievable. Speaker, I, you know what? It, like, these guys get, um, I think they get one question, Order. they get one question every 11 days. Now, that's not a rule that I've put in place. That is something that the people of the province have put in place because for not one, but two elections, they have punished the Liberal Party of Ontario. And now they just punish them again in a by-election, right? Two by and do they ask about the economy? No, because when they were in office, they destroyed the economy. Do they ask about 
Health care? No, because when they were in office, they closed hospitals, fired nurses, and didn't hire doctors. So they don't want to ask about that. They don't ask about infrastructure because when they were in charge of infrastructure, you remember they built bridges upside down. Uh, so what else? So not long-term care because they didn't build any long-term care homes. Not about taxes because they actually increased taxes. Not about red tape because they made us the most overly regulated province in the country. So they're asking about And the supplementary question. Speaker, I'm not surprised you didn't get an answer to this question. Maybe the House Leader's newfound penchant for transparency means the Premier will finally release his phone records. Speaker, this government forgets that the privilege of governing comes with the responsibility of transparency. So their disdain for transparency is at odds with their endless crowing about their record. If their crowing is justified, then there should be no, nothing to hide. But the press had to go to court again to get the information about the shortage of health care workers. The documents pried out of the government's hands by the Canadian press show the information was hidden because, wait for it, the government thinks that it would help Better. nurses to get fair wages. Speaker, to the Premier, if the state of our health care system is not a concern, why did the government try to hide this information? Member for Mississauga Centre will come to order. The member for Brampton North will come to order. Government House Leader may reply. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. This is a Liberal Party, of course. That was when they were in office, Mr. Speaker. Again, raised taxes, uh, made us the most indebted sub-sovereign government in the world, and then have nothing to show for it. Right? It's not like they build hospitals. Not like they build roads, order. Mr. Speaker. Not like they build long-term care homes. Not like they invested in health or education, Mr. Speaker. In fact, they closed. 600 schools across the province, right? They raise taxes for the people of the province of Ontario. You want to talk about accountability? The chief of staff to the premier under the Liberals went to jail, Mr. Speaker, and that is what we inherited in 2018. Since 2018, we have been Order. executing a plan across Order. the province of Ontario. That plan includes making sure we are fiscal responsible government, ensuring that we unleash the power of Northern Ontario Spons. to protect the prosperity of all Ontarians. They called the North a wasteland. We're opening up the Ring of Fire Watch. The member for Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke will come to order. The member for Ottawa South will come to order. We can start the clock. The next question, the member for Oakville. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Energy. It's been a month and a half since the federal Liberal government increased the carbon tax by a whopping 23 per cent. Everything seems to be getting more expensive. Food, gas, energy prices are all on the rise, while pay paychecks are failing to keep pace. Speaker, life is getting harder and harder with this punitive Liberal carbon tax. The Liberal members in this House, instead of asking their federal counterparts to cut the carbon tax, are doubling down in support of this tax, which is hurting Ontario families and businesses. Speaker, can the minister please explain how the carbon tax continues to hurt every single person living in this province? To reply, the Minister of Energy. Speaker, thanks to the member from Oakville for the great question. The carbon tax is a terrible tax, and it's hurting us right now, but the worst part of this tale is that the tax is going to go up and up and up every April 1st. Mr. Speaker, and our good friend from Quebec is here as well. The tax de carbone va augmenter de plus. Carbon tax will go up and up and up. It's bad news for the people of Ontario. It's bad news for the people in Quebec. It's bad news for the people right across our country. Now, our government is doing things differently. The queen of the carbon tax, Bonnie Crombie, is in full support of the Prime Minister and the federal carbon tax. The NDP are in full support of the carbon tax, Mr. Speaker, and Mr. Green over here, he is in full support of the carbon tax as well. The Premier and our government are not in support of a carbon tax. As a matter of fact, Mr. Speaker, we're continuing to lead the country in driving down emissions without a carbon tax. 
I'll remind the members to make reference to each other either by their riding name or their ministerial title. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for your response and for your continued advocacy fighting for the people of Ontario. It's simply unacceptable that the federal Liberals are pricing Ontarians out of grocery stores, out of their homes, and into a situation where they have to choose between heating and eating. Families are struggling now more than ever, and they need our help. Let's ensure we do this right, Speaker. It's time for the Liberals to stop this vision carbon tax and give real financial relief to the people of Ontario. Speaker, can the minister please tell the House what our government is doing to ensure Ontario has clean, reliable, and emission-free energy system without taking a step backwards and imposing a carbon tax on the people of Ontario? Great question. Minister of Energy. I can, Mr. Speaker. We're refurbishing our nuclear facilities, the 18 can-do reactors that we have in Ontario that provide almost 60 percent of our baseload, emissions-free electricity every day. We count on those nuclear facilities, and we're planning on expanding on our expertise, Mr. Speaker, with the new Bruce C and small modular reactors on site at Darlington, which are going to lead the way into the future and help other jurisdictions do what we've already done, and that's eliminate our reliance on coal-fired generation. We are investing in our hydro facilities, Mr. Speaker. Over the last two weeks, I've been in Cornwall with the great member from Stormont, Dundas, South Glengarry, down in Niagara as well at the Sir Adam Beck facilities, announcing refurbishments of our hydroelectric fleet. We just had the largest procurement of battery storage in Canada's history last week to make sure that our non-emitting resources are working more efficiently and that we have the power that we're going to need to continue to attract the multi-billion dollar investments like the ones that are being made today down in Niagara, Mr. Thank you. Next question, the member for Ottawa West, Nepean. Thank you, Speaker. Our schools are experiencing a violence crisis, and it is taking a serious toll on our teachers. 80% of ETFO members have either personally experienced or witnessed violence. Some of these are life-changing injuries. Yet the minister's plan to address violence is to spend 14 cents per day per child on student safety. That's just not enough when teachers are already going to school in Kevlar and classes are being evacuated daily. When will we see a serious plan from the Minister of Education to protect children and workers in our schools? Minister of Education. Thank you, Speaker. You know, one of the ways by which we keep kids safe is by removing distractions in our publicly funded schools. That's why we announced a plan to remove social media from school devices. And members often seem to find it comical with an increase of cyberbullying and increasing levels of distractions where teachers feel powerless to enforce basic policies. Members often don't want us to enforce policies under our schools in the, in, in the, the mindset of members of the Democratic Party. But we understand we've got to have some enforcement and educational tools to get back to basic and restore order and common sense in our schools. It's why we announced $17 million of mental health supports, leveraging community-based mental health. It's why we finally annualize funding for mental health services through the summer to make it better for the family so they get access to the same practitioner. Order. I've been working with the Minister of, of Mental Health and Addictions for the past years to build Response. capacity in our schools and in our communities to keep our kids safe. Removing cell phones from the classroom is not going to protect a single student or teacher who is currently being punched, kicked, or bitten. This minister just doesn't seem to grasp the severity of the situation. A quarter of elementary schools and a third of secondary schools have daily staff shortages. There are more resignations than retirements in the education system. High-quality education requires a qualified educator, but this minister is doing everything he can to drive them away. Parents know that teachers and education workers are the backbone of our education system. Why doesn't the minister think they deserve respect? Minister of Education. Mr. Speaker, I love that the member opposite spoke about qualified educators, and yet the NDP and the Liberals of, of, oppose the, the return of merit-based hiring when it comes to the qualifications of educators. You cannot have it both ways. You cannot articulate Order. or advance the cause of qualified Order. educators and yet deny 
principals the ability to hire based on their experience in the classroom. There's Order. a reason why we revoked Regulation 274, because we believe that merit should triumph and the best educators should get the job. That is what parents expect. Mr. Speaker, we've increased the funding and the staffing in Ontario's publicly funded schools. What we're also doing, a matter of contention with members opposite, is we're elevating the expectations on our school boards to deliver better outcomes for the investments we make in Ontario. Thank you. The next question, the member for Kitchener Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Today we're joined by ADFO members and Catholic educators from across the province. They're here today to teach us about the rising levels of violence in schools. Imagine going to work every day, worried you'll be attacked, sworn at, or threatened, or being off work because of a concussion, mental health concern, or injury. A recent FO study reported that 75% of members experienced or witnessed violence against a staff member. Speaker, anyone who spent time in our classrooms knows that we need adequate support for our students, especially those with complex needs exacerbated by the COVID pandemic. The kids are not okay. School boards are facing staff shortages and the impact of crowded classrooms. To the Premier, will your government develop a plan to address the alarming rise in violence in our schools to keep people safe? Minister of Education. Uh, thank you, Speaker. I, I want to thank the member officer for the question. I know in her former experience as a social worker and education worker in Ontario's publicly funded schools, we are grateful to you and to all the educators who are with us today. It is an issue. It is a serious concern. And there's a reason why the government of Ontario, under our Premier's leadership, was the first in Canada to initiate an anti-human trafficking protocol, the first of its kind to initiate a plan to counter bullying and cyberbullying in every publicly funded school. We've added thousands of EAs, 3,000 additional EAs to our schools, more social workers, more mental health workers, but we're also building that capacity in the community. You know, the establishment of community of the uh, youth mental health hubs have been a massive positive intervention for kids, a one-stop shop of access, and it's because of the leadership of the Min Minister of Mental Health and Addiction that we have these access points. So we're working together to bridge the gaps, reduce the Response. wait times, and support every child in Ontario. And the supplementary question. I appreciate that. I hope we can go further. I was taught that you measure what you value and you change what you measure. In recent years, kids are struggling from a lack of support in, for their mental health and development in the community and at school, which makes education work overwhelming. Folks are leaving the profession, and recruitment is a challenge, which I know as a former school social worker. Boards are struggling to hire EAs, bus drivers, teachers, and the vacancy rates in the Waterloo region and across the province are breaking records. This and the budget shortfall mean that support staff ratios are alarmingly low. In elementary schools alone, the ratio of support staff to students is 1.73 per thousand students. Will the Premier value and measure the realities of workplace violence and the increasing needs for student supports and create a plan to change this trend. Here, here. The Associate Minister of Mental Health and Addictions. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for that question. You know, when we talk about the mental health of children and youth, it doesn't begin and end during the school day. We know that we need to have supports in place, and those supports have to be there. They have to be reliable, but they also have to be there beyond the time that the kids are in school. And since 2019, we've addressed, we've increased annual funding for children and youth by $130 million through the Roadmap to Wellness. In addition, in the last two budgets, another $43 million. Unlike previous governments, we're actually innovating and collaborating with partners to support children and youth. We've opened 22 youth wellness hubs, an additional five will be opening this year. This fund includes the virtual supports, the one-stop uh, talk programs. Our plan for children and youth, and there is a plan for children and youth Response. mental health, is clear. Early interventions to keep kids from harmful behaviors, easy accessibility to them. Children and youth are, are our future, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Newmarket, Aurora. Thank you, Speaker. And my the question is for the Minister of Education. The Liberal carbon tax is increasing the cost of everything for everyone in this province. Not only 
Why is it forcing Ontarians to pay more for their groceries and their home heating, but it is driving up prices for building materials and transportation? Speaker, our government has made historic investments to support the building of critical infrastructure in Ontario, like new schools and childcare spaces. Unfortunately, the Liberal carbon tax imposes significantly financial hurdles for the people who are building our province. It's time for the federal Liberals to do Question. the right thing and scrap this tax. Speaker, can the minister please tell the House how the federal carbon tax is making building more schools more expensive? Order. Order. Parliamentary Assistant, a member for Burlington. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the member for their question, and okay. she's right. Ontario needs more state-of-the-art schools and more childcare spaces. Over the next 10 years, our government is investing in historic $16 billion in capital grants, including a doubling of capital schools fund by 136% from $550 million to $1.3 billion for the 2023-2024 year. To ensure these capital investments are brought online in half the time it took to build schools under the Ontario Liberals. But Mr. Speaker, the member opposite is right. These historic investments in education are being hindered by the federal Liberals' failed carbon tax. A report from the Canadian Energy Centre found that Ontario industries such as mining, utilities, concrete, iron and steel will bear the highest impacts of Response. the federal carbon tax. Mr. Speaker, as our government increases its spending on critical capital files in education, the federal Liberals are taking Ontario backwards by overtaxing the industries we need to support our new and redevelop. Thank you. Supplementary question. Thank you. And thank you to the parliamentary assistant for her response. From groceries to gas, families are suffering the price of the federal Liberals' failed carbon tax. People in my riding of Newmarket Aurora tell me that the cost of living in Ontario is becoming unsustainable as a result of this regressive tax. It is driving up the cost of everyday essentials and making it more expensive for parents to drive their children to school and extracurriculars. Speaker, Ontario families need economic stability to ensure that they can properly invest in their children's educational success. That's why our government must continue to advocate for Ontarians and call on the federal government to scrap this tax. Speaker, can the parliamentary assistant please tell the House how our government is making life more affordable? Thank you very much. <laughs> Member for Markham Unionville and parliamentary assistant. Thank you, Speaker. The federal Liberals are playing politics with our children's future by making it harder for parents to invest in their children's success. But here in Ontario, under the leadership of Premier Ford, we understand that parents, not governments, know what is the best for their children. Parents should not have to choose between heating their homes and, heating and feeding their families. That's why we extend the guest tax cut of 10 cents a litre and scrap the license plate sticker fee, saving hundreds of dollars which support parents to drive their kids to school, money that they can use to help keep the lights on and heat their homes and schools while their children work, play and study. We introduce the Ontario Child Care Tax Credit, allowing families to claim up to 75% of their childcare expenses, putting more money back into the pockets to reinvest their children's future. Yes, Mr. Speaker, time and time again, the opposition prop up by the Ontario. Thank you very much. Uh, the next question, member for Hamilton West, Ancaster Dundas. Uh, my question to the Premier. Uh, parents have been calling me distressed with the skyrocketing cost of baby formula. 
Uh, we all know that the cost of groceries is a huge burden on Ontario families. Baby formula prices are completely unaffordable. And sadly, families in Ontario, in all of our ridings, are forced to water down formula to make it last longer. So while food prices uh, continue to soar, continue to rise, grocery stores like Loblaws continue to post massive profits, straight up price gouging. So my question to the Premier is why are you hiding from the pleas of parents and sitting on your hands while powerful retailers profit at the expense of our Ontario families? Reply, the Minister of Finance. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Well, thank you, thank you. Mr. Speaker, through you to the member opposite for that question. You know, obviously, uh, food prices going up uh, hurts many people across this province. But you know what, Mr. Speaker? Uh, what is a big part of that is the gas tax. You know, the carbon tax is going up in Ottawa, 17 cents since they've started. We've reduced the gas tax and, through other measures, the price at the pumps by almost 10.7 cents a litre. So one's going down, the other's going up. Mr. Speaker, the price of gas goes into the uh, food processing. It goes into the farmers. A member from Huron Bruce representing farmers right across this great province. Mr. Speaker, this is unacceptable. We're, putting, we're the party that's putting money back into the pockets of people in Ontario, the businesses in Ontario, so food prices Response. will come down. This is a government that's got the backs of the people of Ontario. Uh, you know, Speaker, that is a shameful answer from the Minister of Finance, and I invite your constituents to call you and tell you what they are truly experiencing. And I would remind the House, through the Speaker, that my question was about feeding babies, and this government chose to hide behind the carbon tax. Yeah. Ontarians see through your excuses. Ontarians are Order. fed up Order. with this government taking the side of powerful billionaires. They see skyrocketing grocery costs Order. while at the same time corporations like Loblaws are shamelessly making record profits. Order. And they think Stop the clock. Okay. The member for Etobicoke Lakeshore will come to order. The member for Brampton North will come to order. The member for Mississauga Aaron Mills will come to order. The Associate Minister of Small Business will come to order. I apologize to the member. Start the clock. The member for Hamilton West and Pastor Dundas. Thank you, Speaker. I wish I saw the same kind of passion from this government for babies that can't be fed properly in this province. This, the people in Ontario see this government doing nothing, absolutely nothing, to help them feed their babies. And so my question to the Premier, to this government, what will you do today, today, for struggling parents to ensure that their babies do not go hungry? Members will please take their seats. The Minister of Finance. No, Mr. Speaker, what the member opposite and her party can do is vote for the budget, which has the backs of the people of Ontario. You know, in that budget is cutting the gas tax, continuing the cut in the gas tax. Mr. Speaker, that budget has the integrated one fair, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, it has guaranteed annual income supplements for our seniors so that their payments are indexed to inflation. So you know what the member opposite can do? You know what is, you know what is really shameful? is watching 300,000 manufacturing jobs, the taillights leave Ontario. But you know what's really good is the 700,000 headlights of jobs that are coming into Ontario, Mr. Speaker. This, this member opposite's party supported the Liberal government that raised the taxes. They invented red tape over there, Mr. Speaker. They drove jobs out of Ontario. Mr. Speaker, we're building Ontario. We're, we're supporting the workers and we're protecting the taxpayers. The member for Hamilton West and Pastor Dundas will come to order. The member for Hamilton Mountain will come to order. The next question, the member for Etobicoke Lakeshore. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Solicitor General. Fire, firefighters hold an essential role in our communities. 
They risk our lives. Uh, they risk their lives to keep us and our loved ones safe. And I want to give a shout out to the men and women of the stations number 431, 432, 433, 434, 435 from Etobicoke Lakes. Or thank you for your service. But speaker, the Liberal carbon tax is placing additional financial burdens on our public safety system. People in my riding of Etobicoke Lakeshore are concerned how this punitive tax is impacting first responders in our province. They want to ensure that Ontario's firefighters have the support they need to protect our communities. Speaker, could the Solicitor General discuss how the carbon tax is impacting firefighters' efforts in Ontario? Monsieur le Président, je voudrais... Speaker, I'd like to thank my colleague for her excellent question. I'm proud to support our firefighters and all of those who take care of the province's security every day. These are wonderful people who protect us. Bonnie Crombie, as mayor of Mississauga, knew proof positive every time a fire truck in Mississauga had to fill up its truck. An average truck is about 200 litres, and if you do the math at 21 and a half cents per diesel, Mr. Speaker, that's $43, Ouch. $43 as a fill-up, which is ridiculous. Mr. Speaker, it's time Bonnie Crombie, as mayor of Mississauga, who had to approve the fire department budget, come clean with Ontarians and say, I am against this tax. It's Response. affecting our firefighters. Here, here. Supplementary question. Merci and thank you, Speaker. Thank you. The Solicitor General for his response. It's proud. I'm proud. And I'm proud to hear that our government is standing up for the public safety and fighting this unfair carbon tax. Now, unlike the carbon tax queen, Bonnie Crombie, and her party of nine, our government knows that this tax makes life harder and more expensive for hardworking families and businesses throughout our entire province. Not only does it increase the cost of goods, but it's also driving up the cost of fuel and gasoline for everyone in this province, including our firefighters and those trucks that drive right in front of me along the Gardner on its way to the food terminal every day. You know, Speaker, we have heard how the NDP and the Liberals won't stand up for our public safety her heroes, but I know we, this party led by Premier Ford, will always Jim. stand up for our public safety heroes. Speaker, can the Solicitor General furly, further elaborate on our importance of cancelling the carbon tax for Ontario's firefighters? Solicitor General. Mr. Speaker, there's no government in the history of Ontario that has had the backs of the firefighters as our government led by Premier Ford. And you know what, Mr. Speaker, we're proud of this. I speak to Greg Horton, I speak to Rob Grinwin, the association presidents of the chiefs and the professional firefighters. We have volunteer firefighters in this legislature, the member from Brantford Brent, the member from Sarnia Lambton, and others who come forward to keep it safe. But Bonnie Crombie, as mayor of Mississauga, knew to the last cent how much carbon tax was affecting the firefighters. It is absolutely proof positive. Bonnie Crombie needs to come clean and say this is the most regressive tax that is affecting our public safety. It's affecting, it's affecting our fire safety, and she should say, I'm not in favour of it. I will support cancelling it. Right on. Thank you. That concludes our question period for this morning. There being no further